Our, moderated this, our moderator this morning is David Rothkopf. He's a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endow Endowment for International Peace, where he has written um, Running the World, the Inside Story of the National Security Council and the Architects of American Power and Superclass, the Global Power Elite and the World. Our first speaker is Dr. Corey Shockey, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and an associate professor of international security at the United States Military Academy. Next we have Dr. Stuart Patrick, who is a senior fellow and director of the Program on International Institutions and Global Governance at the Council on Foreign Relations. And finally, Para Khanna is a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation and the author of A Second World, Empires and Influence in a New Global Order. Please help me welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. We've got a great panel. Uh, it covers virtually every issue that there is in the world today. Um, but fortunately for all of you, we have insights and solutions both. So take notes and by the time we're done you should be in, in great shape to just go home. Uh, uh, in any event, we've, we've, got, we've got great folks and what our plan is is we're going to go through a couple of rounds of questions and then open it up to you as soon as possible so that we can really cover what's on your mind as early as possible. So please think about what you want to ask uh, and get involved as early as you possibly can. Um, there's sort of two parts to the title of this discussion. One is new rules and new system. The other is America's role within the context of that world. And I'm going to be very literal minded and I'm going to take it in just that way. And so naturally the first question that comes to the mind of this particular skeptic is, are there new rules? Is there a new system? So Corey, why don't you, uh, why don't you start us there? Rules, but I do think there is there are got it okay so uh, I do think the rules are changing in important ways because of the way that globalization is affecting state power but I think a lot of people overstate the extent of the change states still have the ability to set boundaries about immigration capital flows important things that affect the shape of society so I do think the rules are new but they're not as much new as the general discourse suggests do you agree? Are you nodding because you agree? Yeah, I, I would say that you know at, at the um, at the outset of the Obama. This is admin. going to be the shortest panel of your day. <laughs> there are no new rules. No, no, there's, there is not there's a, a little. A little Everybody go home. That's right. Yeah. No, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll inject a little bit of I'll okay. inject a little bit of difference here. Um, you know, there ha there have been um, some changes uh, over the past uh, two years, partly as a result of the global uh, financial crisis uh, and as a result of uh, a, a sense that uh, after uh, a period where the United States did not appear was not perceived to be as interested in multilateral cooperation, that um, there's a new dedication to uh, multilateral engagement. Um, we've, seen, um, we've seen a number of changes uh, in, in, in rules governing the global financial system, in particular uh, um, creations of uh, new regulatory mechanisms, et cetera, um, changes in, uh, in the nature of uh, what the International Monetary Fund does, in, um, in the balance of power within some of the international financial institutions. However, I would agree, by and large, with, uh, with Corey that um, the fundamental reform that a lot of people expected um, at, uh, at the outset of the Obama administration when people sort of thought of a new Bretton Woods moment or a new present at the creation moment, uh, we haven't really seen that and I think there are a number of different reasons for that and one of them um, is that um, it's just very diff difficult uh, when you have an existing order and institutions to sort of rejigger uh, the sort of sense of influence or what the basic ground rules are. I do think, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come back to this, that one of the big challenges for the United States uh, going forward is to try to integrate um, rising powers, uh, particularly China, but also countries like India and Brazil, uh, which sometimes come to some of these global issues with a very different mindset, whether we're talking about trade, nuclear nonproliferation, or human rights. And so I think that's going to be one of the enduring challenges we face going forward. Well, let, let, me, let me follow up on these two questions before I go on to uh, Prague. If you, if you look at the lay of the land right now, um, the, this is way too hot. Uh, if I can fix that. Um, 
I'm not, I'm right. I may not be that technical, but um, uh, but in it, this was even a Jewish boy from New Jersey could fix the microphone. Um, uh, in, in any event, the uh, if you look at the lay of the land, we're not in the bipolar world of the Cold War. We're not really in the unipolar world of the, the, the maybe 15 or 20 years after. We're into something new. It's multipolar. Uh, we're not in the world of the G7. We're moving into the world of the G20, at least. Um, we're not in the world where the center of intellectual or economic gravity is over the Atlantic. It's now over the Pacific. Uh, we're in a world in which nuclear capability is spreading to new places. We're in a world in which asymmetric conflict give leverage to new places. So a lot of things are different. And I'm just, you know, there's a tug of war always between inertia and what's new. Are we actually just, it's, it's not that we don't have new rules and new systems, but we're on the verge of some new rules and some new systems? Do we think that there are major changes that are gonna stand in contrast to what we've seen? So maybe let's just go back to you guys and then I'm gonna come to Prague because I know that you think it's all actually very, very old rules, but I will get to that in one second. I agree with your judgment that it, it's messy and it's difficult to see the pattern. And I also agree with Stuart's point that, that the rules are, are breaking down to some extent. I mean, the, the predictability of state interaction. But again, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be a one-trick pony, but it does seem to me that the rules were always overstated. I mean, if you look at, at the management of the NATO alliance, presumably the place where American hegemony was most predominant, this was always difficult. It was always a struggle. It's, you know, the European uh, pipeline agreement with the Soviets in the 1970s. Like, it's difficult. We overstate a golden age in which rules governed things and, and things worked predictably and easily. Okay, yeah, I'm trying I, to make a case that there are some new rules coming. It, yeah, you, I mean, I, I think that what, what's difficult is, um, is that we've inherited a, a, a slew of international institutions that were created for a different order and aren't particularly adept at solving some of the major problems that we found, find today. Um, so that we have NATO, but I think part of the, and NATO is working on its new strategic concept now, and you know, people joke at the Pentagon, you know, NATO, keep the dream alive. Because it, it's really hard to know what, you know, we're not waiting. Not known for its great yeah, great, great sense of humor, exactly. Uh, but, but it's, uh, you, you know, what is its rationale uh, in, in the world ahead? And during the Cold War, at least there was some solidarity between the United States and its allies, for instance, on what uh, NATO's role is. That now is up for grabs. The United Nations, um, one of the interesting conversations over the last year has been, uh, what's interesting is this within the walls of the United Nations. Wow, are we still relevant at all anymore? You remember when George W. Bush in 2002 went to the United Nations and said, prove your relevance by dealing with Iraq. Whatever one thinks about the way that war uh, unfolded, um, he was trying to suggest that it, and perhaps its relevance was uh, declining. And, uh, and what's interesting, people inside the institution are asking those very same questions. We live in a much more fluid environment where there are, are rising powers who are clamoring for, um, for, for a role. They, they want to change some of the rules of the, uh, rules of the global trading system. They're pushing the envelope on issues of currency and the dollar's role in the world, and perhaps that's going to come up for grabs. Um, there are the, the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty regime, as uh, David suggested, is under extreme stress. We need to have new rules, but the problem is that there's so much institutional inertia built into what we have already that it's hard to know uh, where those are going to be coming from. Okay. So, Parag, you, you've written a terrific book which looks at the rise of the second world and, and, t and talks about some fundamental changes that are taking place. You've got another book coming out which is going to look at this from another angle. Presumably, you must be more in the school that there's some new rules coming, right? I'm very much of that school. Um, you know, we can't, we wouldn't be talking about new rules and new systems and the need for them if we didn't have a new order. Therefore, I think it's beyond dispute that we are entering a new order of some kind, or primarily first a disorder. And you know, the the unipolar world is is I would argue is, uh, is, is very rapidly shifting towards a multipolar one. And that, you know, let's go back to what order means. Order doesn't mean is America on top or is someone else on top. Order is an analytical question. What, what is the distribution of power in the world, irrespective of who is uh, 
who sits on top of the hierarchy. And the distribution of power is in fact dissipating, changing very rapidly. That's why we talk about rising powers. That's why we can also talk about uh, multinational corporations, non-state actors, transnational threats. All of that diffusion means that we are moving towards something of a, uh, something that is more unpredictable and somewhat more disorderly than what we've had so far. So you can't even talk about a system until you appreciate, or a new system, until you appreciate just how quickly the order that we think we knew and think we may even still have is crumbling. Uh, and, that, and then think about what new system might come in the pipeline. The system that we seem to be talking about is this multilateral system, uh, the United Nations and associated institutions, or if you're really up, up to the moment, then you'll talk about the G8 or the G20. Well, even that doesn't quite gra capture this new set of powers, new set of players that even the non-state actors that are out there. So you can't really talk about that G20 system as if it somehow re reflects this new order. It doesn't. It doesn't take into account all the actors. It doesn't take into account all the kinds of power. It doesn't even take into account all the different issues that are on the agenda. And then you get to rules for that system, which have to be negotiated in light of all of those new players. But a lot of them aren't even at the table. So we're just at the very first phase of a very long period of renegotiating uh, where the order lies, who has the power, what kind of system can possibly capture it, and what kinds of rules that system may have. It's day one, and the answer isn't the G20. Well, but, but let's, let's follow that up a second, because there have been periods in history where the system has changed, but the rules haven't. And typically what happens in those systems is disequilibrium, tumult, conflict, the 30 years war, World War I, World War II. These things happened because powers rose up, new conflicts came, and there was no system for resolving disputes effectively or providing stability on an ongoing basis. Do you think we're in one of those periods? I think, I think we are very much in one of those periods, and I, I think that it's best likened to the Middle Ages, a time approximately a thousand years ago. That was actually a period of history where we in, in the Western world I think of it very much as synonymous with the Dark Ages in Europe, but it was actually a time when China, India, the Arab Islamic world all sort of flourished. Uh, and they were, each could call their own shots on the regional level. And that's kind of what the world actually looks like today. Uh, we can't really boss each other around as much as we thought, as much as America has thought that it could, uh, because you look today at, at the rise of China and India and, uh, and, and powers in the Middle East and so forth. So I think it's actually a very useful analogy. That world then is multipolar or apolar. And I think that that's a, a much more accurate characterization of where we are right now. And yes, therefore, it means that we don't, again, have a, a security council which represents those power centers, and therefore, they all come together and, and negotiate uh, their differences. Uh, things are very much handled ad hoc and according to cultural principles and, and, and local rules uh, that, that may not derive from international law. Now, I know you want to jump in, but can I pose a question uh, even, even before you do? It, you know, we, we talk about the G20, and you know, that's a step forward. We're two years into that, and so far the G20 can't really agree to anything meaningful. The Treasury ministers, finance ministers just met, they sort of said, well, you know, it's kind of the Rodney King approach to world finance, which can't we all get along here? Um, and not, you know, any signing up to anything particularly serious. But the G20 only deals, as Parag implied, with economic issues. And when you look at the security structures, a lot of those big players who we talk a lot about rising up, the Chinese, the Indians, some of these others, they don't want to play in that game. NATO you, it struggled to go out of theater into Afghanistan, and they don't want to stay there. They want to come back home, and Europe can't get together a foreign policy. Isn't there a particular void in this era in terms of security structures? No, I don't think there's a particular void in this era because I think that's always been the case. Um, I think we overestimate the extent to which the United Nations was ever all that helpful in managing all of our problems. I think we overestimate the extent to which NATO was always helpful in managing all of our problems. I mean, if you think about President Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles in 1954 talking about the NATO idea possibly run its course, or the Suez crisis in which we refuse to help two of our allies in a war they're fighting. This is always a lot dicier, and I think one of the 
risks uh, big intellectuals run in talking about it is, is seeing systemic patterns and thinking institutions affect more than they do. Seems to me there's a lot more continuity in this conversation, even Parag, than your comments suggest um, about the medieval model, because it, it seems to me a state's what has always been true, even in that high watermark of systemic cooperation, the post-World War II American age, is that it's always the roll your sleeves up hard work of one government persuading another government what it wants to do on security, on economics, on trade deals. It, the individual adds up to something greater than itself, but the systemic order doesn't remove the responsibility of individual states working and managing their interests. Yeah. I think there's a constant tension throughout history between disequilibrium and equilibrium, and you, you, you never get to absolute on either side. Sometimes you have a little more equilibrium and sometimes you have a little more disequilibrium. But Stuart, I want to pose a specific question to you about this. You talked a little bit about the rise of emerging powers. We've seen an example of the new role emerging powers might play recently with Iran, where the Brazilians and the Turks got together and they tried to cut a deal and were immediately, and by immediately I mean within about an hour and 10 minutes, undercut by Washington that was really uncomfortable with you know, a plan B, with an, you know, a diplomatic avenue that didn't go through Washington. Is this you know, a sign of, of, of a, a coming series of problems that we're going to have or a set of issues we've got to grapple with? Yeah, sure, Dave. I think that it is. I think it, what's interesting, if you look, uh, as many of you probably have, at the Obama's, uh, Obama administration's national security strategy the, that was released this spring, one of the main themes that it has uh, in that document is the importance of integrating rising powers as, uh, they don't use the phrase responsible stakeholders as the Bush administration did for China, but in effect, that's what they're saying. Let's bring these countries into the tent and therefore they will embrace this sort of Western or established liberal international order that's, that, uh, that we've come to take for granted since 1945. I think I think what um, uh, the gambit uh, that uh, Turkey and Brazil uh, made uh showed very quickly the, the United States, uh, the Obama administration, that uh, other countries have their own ideas about, uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 the situations that would, that would require Security Council action, what they would be prepared themselves to, to countenance. Um, and, uh, and I think they were taken by surprise. I think the administration was, was clumsy in this regard in how it handled it, certainly diplomatically clumsy, because uh, they should have probably tried to co a little bit more to co-op these two countries. Um, but I think that it's, a, it's uh, in a way, the shape of things to come. I, I would disagree a little bit with Corey in the sense that um, I think there are elements of continuity, yes, but I think that to answer David's question, I think the world does risk being a little bit out of balance, more than a little bit out of balance on the security front. I think that you've seen great adjustments um, with respect to uh, moving from the G8 to the G20. You've seen some uh, adjustment within the international financial institutions, even actually a couple weeks ago in, um, in Korea in terms of readjusting some of the, the weight within uh, the World Bank and the IMF. Um, but in the Security Council, I, th I think that it is problematic. I, it's not necessarily dangerous in the short or even medium term that the Security Council does not reflect the world as it exists today. But the fact that it does not have India and Brazil and arguably uh, Japan and Germany at the same time is problematic when you think historically. I do not think that compared... The, the Security Council doesn't work very well, and not having those countries in it makes it illegitimate. Right. Well, they, it, 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 it appears as illegitimate. It also may, under, just at a practical level, those countries will not invest in the United Nations in terms of actual resource commitments as much as we would like if they are not inside that body. Now, there is a question, particularly with the big emerging developing countries who want to free ride, um, they do tend to want a free ride, and they say, hey, we're, we're developing countries. We're poor. We can't make those sorts of contributions. Like China, by China. With $2 trillion in the bank. Right, exactly. With $2 trillion. But if you talk to the Chinese, I this is... I wish I was there. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, we all wish you were this poor. But this is a constant refrain, as you know, when you speak to the Chinese that, you know, wow, on a per capita basis, we're really still a very poor country. And you hear some of the same things from the Indians and from the Brazilians. And at some stage, these countries have to decide, am I a card-carrying member of the non line movement in the group of 77, the big develop, the developing countries, or am I in the inner sanctum ready to pull my own weight? Well, that, that raises an interesting question, Prague. You know, we talk about multipolar world, and a lot of the time we talk about that, there's a bit of an admonition built in, which is, calm down, United States of America, you're playing too big a role in this, we need to balance things out. But there's another component to it, which we, 
we don't hear perhaps as much of in the United States, which is grow up the rest of you. The Europeans don't pull their weight. The Chinese don't pull their weight. The Indians don't pull their weight. Um, and you know, give you a perfect example of, of, we have a whole host of issues in the Middle East, and for the first time ever, China is central to those issues. There is no way you get Iran to back off of its plan unless there's pressure from China. China's central in Pakistan. China's central in Central Asia. And they don't seem to want to help out. They don't seem to want to take a stance on terrorism. They don't want to take a stance on weapons of mass destruction. They, is that sustainable? Um, and, and, and what are the consequences? I, I know you've like, followed very closely Afghanistan. You might want to take that as a, as a particular illustration of the roles of these emerging powers and where it's going to play out. Well, let's talk about this question of they don't take a stance. They actually do take a stance. Not taking a stance or laying low uh, is very much a stance. And Afghanistan is a great example. You can go to the Chinese and say, can you help us out in Afghanistan or in Pakistan? And what does that mean? Does that mean that they have to sign on to our end vision of what that place should look like? If they don't, then that doesn't mean that they're not doing something. Well, they seem to be they're willing to mine the lithium in Afghanistan, well, exactly. should they? And that, and that is very much what their long-term goal is. But the notion that another state is not uh, playing a global role just because it's not supporting our vision is, uh, is actually not, not exactly compatible. Uh, they're doing a lot of things. Uh, if China's vision, for example, with uh, the role that it's played in nuclear proliferation around the region is to say, well, you know, the United States is, is, uh, is going to be bogged down in this part of the world uh, and around the world for a very long time, and we're going to let them expend their energies and gradually uh, withdraw and retreat in some way, and then we'll be able to move in and have more influence. And that's what's happening. In, and uh, Patrick mentioned earlier countries that have a mind of their own. And to me, all of these so-called second world countries, these middle tier countries, these rising powers, do precisely that. But you see the, that ambition play out first and foremost on the regional level. So at the same time that you see Brazil being very active in climate and trade debates and even with respect to uh, diplomacy with, uh, with Iran, they are also building a much stronger uh, presence in the region and a leadership role in the region, building regional institutions. You see this happening with Europe's own sort of self-absorbed focus on itself, though it has widened and deepened at the same time and has grown to have 27 member countries in it. Even the African Union is, again, at really early stages. Uh, China has been working on developing developing both the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has a very strong role in Central Asia, as well as this East Asian Community, East Asian Summit type of arrangement. So when we look, when we jump straight from the national level to the global level, we miss this entire set of activities going on that are extremely important. And regions are becoming very self-absorbed. They want to manage the rela their own relations with their neighbors rather than have it be mediated from the outside. And I think that shows really how, if countries like China and like Brazil and like India can become leaders in their own part of the world, then you're going to see them more confidently step outward and start to negotiate some of these global issues more. I don't think you with Parag um, in that, but it seems to me that you underestimate the difficulty of them getting from where they are uh, to their vision of where they'd like to be. Take China, for example. I, I agree with your description. It looks to me like what the Chinese strategy is to free ride on the existing system, allow the United States to expand all of the systemic energy, pick off opportunities where you can, cheating on the Iran sanctions, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a terrific near-term approach. It maximizes their prospects. But it's less clear to me that's a successful long-term approach. Because if you are not investing in making the world a better place and helping the Afghans through their difficulties, eventually the law of gravity applies to China as it does to us. And if I were advising the Chinese government, I would have them read the history of United Fruit in Honduras and Central America because their basic approach to places they are investing looks a lot like American multinational corporations in the 1890s and that didn't work out so politically successfully for us as we tried to establish our role in the world. Well, I think there are a lot more difficulties associated with what they're trying to pull off than we sometimes uh, freight them with. Well, let's, let's talk about that and then I, I do want to open it up to you folks so think about your questions. So I'm going to ask one last round of questions here about America, and then I want to do that. But maybe the Chinese are very canny. In fact, 
any country that's grown for 30 or 40 years at 6 or 7 percent a year and has risen as rapidly as they've written is, is certainly very canny and they've avoided a lot of pitfalls along the way. One of the things they're best at is figuring just how far they can get in a negotiation without giving anything up. They're, they're, they're really good at that. And one of the ploys that a lot of these countries have been using is, well, let's, you know, it's, it's kind of like that old commercial you remember, you know, let's let Mikey eat it. You know, you know and, and, and they think, well, let's let the United States eat it. You know, let's let the United States take care of solving these problems, carrying the weight on security, doing these kind of things. And that seems like a pretty good strategy because thus far, the United States has stepped up. And terrorism's a global problem, but we were the ones to, you know, that took it upon ourselves and I think not entirely successfully uh, managed an effort to go after it. Uh, we, you know, we've gone into some regional issues. And, 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 and we're paying the price for this, which is a huge, you know, what is it, $2.7 billion a week in Afghanistan or whatever it is. We're, we're paying a lot of money to do these things, and they're free riders. How long can that go on? And more importantly, and Stuart, let me turn this to you, how long can we go on playing the role that we've been playing? Or do we have to figure out some new burden sharing calculus, um, or we're just gonna go bust or, or perhaps more accurately go more bust than we already are. Well, there's no question that, um, that the domestic political dynamic and domestic f fiscal situation in the United States um, would suggest that the grand strategy that we pursue in, the, in going forward is going to be a little less grand.